Kubernetes can be very daunting because there are a lot of pitfalls for new people. This is because Kubernetes expects you to know all the Kubernetes concepts. It also expects you to know things like containers, like Docker. And Docker containers also have a lot of assumptions that you're expected to know. In today's video, I'll be showing you how to learn Kubernetes the practical way. Today, we'll take a look at a traditional popular setup, a front end app or a website connected to a back-end database with a proxy in the front which handles traffic. Now it is very common for folks to run these types of services on virtual machines or cloud-based solutions. But a popular question that people have is how do we take all of this stuff and move it to Kubernetes? And when it comes to learning Kubernetes, this is where people fall off the cliff. Firstly, you need to know how to containerize your application, like building a Docker file. You need to understand the container assumptions, like the file system being immutable. When the container dies, all the files inside of the container is lost, which means you need to create volumes to persist data. It also means you cannot install things on your virtual machine. It all has to go within the container. You're also expected to understand networking like exposing ports. Once you understand that and you've built your container, you can now use that to schedule it onto Kubernetes. Now Kubernetes expects you to know all of those containerization assumptions, plus the Kubernetes assumptions like nodes or VMs in Kubernetes can terminate at any time, meaning it could happen that your containers move from one VM to another. Kubernetes also assumes that your containers are all running on the same network and can talk to each other. It assumes that you understand networking as well as storage solutions. Today we're going to take our traditional app front end and back end, create containers. Then we're going to start a local Kubernetes cluster and deploy our containers onto it. Then we can learn Kubernetes by learning about deployments, pods, services, config maps, secrets, ingresses and more. This is a very common situation that people find themselves in. You have a website as a front end connected to a database or a back end, and then you have some proxy in the front that routes traffic to your front end. Now to adopt Kubernetes, it expects you to know all the basic building blocks of Kubernetes. Like it expects you to know what a pod is. It expects you to understand the different deployment strategies like a deployment, a daemon set or a stateful set. Now, which one do you pick? Also, how do you get traffic to your website? How does it get a public IP address? How do you expose your back end so your front end can access it over the network? Kubernetes expects you to know what a service is and the different service types. Now, again, which one do you pick? Now for running the backend database, Kubernetes expects you to know how to deal with state, like a database. Where do you store your files and what happens if your Postgres database instance moves to another machine? It's likely that your data would be lost. In this case, Kubernetes expects you to know about stateful sets. It expects you to understand storage plugins like persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. Now, once you understand all these building blocks of Kubernetes, you can use them to build up your infrastructure. Now, the best way to learn about Kubernetes is to take a real world problem, a common architecture, containerize it, and then deploying it to Kubernetes using and learning about each building block. So in today's video, we're going to be doing just that. So without further ado, let's go. So if we take a look at my GitHub repo, I have a Kubernetes folder and in there I have a tutorials folder and under tutorials, we're going to start with a basic tutorial and a readme. So this guide is aimed to fast track your Kubernetes learning by focusing on a practical hands on guide. This has all the steps like working with Docker, running Kubernetes and then focuses on each of the building blocks. So be sure to check out the link down below to the source code so you can follow along. Now, before you dive into Kubernetes, it's very important that you understand containers because that's where the journey starts. We're going to be taking our traditional architecture, containerizing it, and then putting it onto Kubernetes. So a brief summary of containerization is firstly, we need to build a Docker file. Docker file will hold all the files needed by our application. For networking, we need to understand that to access our web server, it needs to expose a port. For configurations, we can use a volume mount to mount configuration files into the container. 
This means you can run it on dev with a set of configs and then run it on production with a different set of configs. You can also use a volume mount to mount insensitive files like a secret or use environment variables. We have to understand that if our container terminates, which can often happen, the files inside the container will be lost. So we need to persist data using a volume or store data in a database instead. And then finally, it's generally a best practice to run one process per container. So we're going to need a container for our front end and a separate container for our back end. Now the Kubernetes journey always starts with containers. So what we're going to need to do is go ahead and grab Docker. I'm going to assume that you already have this. You have Docker for Mac, Windows and Linux. And now that we have Docker installed, the first thing I'm going to want to do is run all my containers on the same network. So I'm going to want to go ahead and create a new network by saying Docker network create, and I'm going to call my network WordPress. So I go ahead and run that. That'll create a new network. This means all my containers can talk to each other. And now that we have a network, the second thing we need is our container images. So in my tutorials basics folder, I have a Docker files folder and in here I have a MySQL docker file and a WordPress docker file. So this represents our two container images that we'll want to build and run. So this is a very common scenario where companies have a front-end app like a WordPress site running on one VM in the cloud and then perhaps have a back-end like Postgres or MySQL which also runs on another VM. So the first step of the containerization journey is to build docker files for these instances. So I would generally start by going on to Docker Hub and finding the Docker images that you're going to need. So in this case here, we can see on Docker Hub, we have WordPress and we have different tags. So you can find different versions of WordPress running on different versions of Apache. So you want to find the appropriate base image that matches your current WordPress setup. And then for the back end, we're going to want to run MySQL. So for MySQL, we can also take a look at the supported tags and versions and find a Docker file that will be suitable for our instance of MySQL. Alternatively, we can use a managed version of MySQL instead of running it ourselves. Now, if we take a look at my two Docker files, if I go to the WordPress Docker file, you can see I've chosen a version of WordPress and I've kept it very simple for demo purposes. I say from WordPress and I'm going to run 5.9 and I've left a space here where you can go ahead and copy files, plugins or code that you've written from your Git repo. You can copy that into the Docker file and then expose the port that you need. And if we take a look at the MySQL Docker file, I've done something slightly similar. I've said from MySQL, I'm going to choose 5.7. And again, you can make any changes to the Docker file over here, like add some default configuration options, install any dependencies, and then I'm going to expose port 3306. So the purpose of the Docker file is to represent the source of truth of your applications, all the dependencies, the operating system version, and everything that you need to run. To build up my container image, I'm going to change directory to the Kubernetes tutorial basics folder and I'm firstly going to build my WordPress docker file by saying docker build minus f and point to the location of that docker file. I'm going to say dot because I want to use the current working directory as my build context and I'm going to say minus t and tag the image as WordPress dash example. Go ahead and run that and that'll build up our WordPress container image. Now once the container image is fully built I can go ahead and run our WordPress container by saying docker run minus it i'm going to run it interactively i'm going to remove the container when it's done and then i'm going to say minus p expose a port as mentioned before i'm going to expose port 80 i'm going to run my container on the wordpress network and then i'm going to pass the name of the container that i want to run so i'm going to copy this paste this to the terminal and this will start up wordpress and if we go to localhost on port 80 it'll automatically hit the setup page of wordpress and if I go ahead and set it up, you'll see that it'll need a database name, username and password. So we need a database up and running. Now, as I mentioned before, we can either use a managed instance of a database running on a cloud, which means we don't have to manage MySQL, but it's also possible to run MySQL in a Docker container as well. Now to run MySQL, what I'm going to do firstly, I'm just going to press control C and stop the WordPress container. And I'm going to go ahead and build MySQL container by saying Docker build minus F 
going to the MySQL Docker file, pass in the build context and tag it as MySQL dash example. So we're going to build MySQL and tag that image. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you're running a database where you want to store files, if a container dies, the files will be lost. So we need to create a Docker volume or some place where we can persist the data and mount it into the container. And this is where a lot of people struggle because there are a number of strategies you can follow. You firstly have to mount the files into the container. Now you can mount it from various different places, but it's up to you. And that may change the reliability of your application. You can mount it from the local VM. You can attach an external disk to that VM and mount that. You can attach a network store, but you also got to consider latency. Or you can go one step further and run a database cluster where you run multiple instances and replicate for high availability. So in this demo, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder called data, and that's where I'm going to mount and persist data. When MySQL stops and restarts, it's going to mount the files again. To run MySQL, it's very simple. I say docker run, remove the container when it's done. I'm going to run it in background mode using dash D. I'm going to call it MySQL. I'm going to run it on the WordPress network. And here are a few configurations I'm going to pass in using environment variables. I'm going to set my database as example DB. I'm going to create a default user called example user. I'm going to set its password as example password. And I'm going to tell MySQL that I want a random root password generated. And here's the important part. I'm going to say minus V. This is indicating a volume. And I'm going to mount the data folder I just created, which is in the current working directory, to the location where MySQL stores data, which is under var lib MySQL. So inside the container, there's a folder called var lib MySQL where data will be stored. MySQL doesn't know where this data comes from. It just expects it inside the container. But we're bringing a volume mount. So if MySQL dies and starts up again, it will recover from failure. And then we finally pass in the name of the container image that we tagged. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this, paste it to the terminal, and this will start up MySQL in background mode. If I say Docker PS, it'll list our containers that are running. Now I can go ahead and rerun WordPress and connect it to MySQL by saying Docker run. I can run it in background mode as well. I can say I want to remove it when it's done. I can say I want to expose port 80. I want to call this one WordPress. I want to run it on the WordPress network and I can pass in some configuration to WordPress to tell it where to connect to MySQL. So I pass it the WordPress host, the user, the password for the database, as well as the database name. You can also configure these settings by mounting in a config file. And then finally, I'm going to pass in the name of my container image. I'm going to go ahead and run that. And that will now start up our container in background mode. If I say Docker PS, we can now see we have two containers, our front end and our back end up and running. And if I go back to our WordPress instance, we can see that we now have the installation. I can go ahead and say continue. And and here we can go and set up our site. This will go ahead and set up WordPress in our MySQL database and we can go ahead and log in. And there we go. We now have WordPress running in a container on our local machine. Now to clean up all these resources locally, I can say Docker RM minus F. I can remove the WordPress container. I can do the same for the MySQL container. I can go ahead and remove the network WordPress and finally remove the data that I've stored on my machine. So it's very important to run through this process thoroughly on your local machine using Docker containers so that you understand that your infrastructure is working before moving to Kubernetes. Next up, we'll want to run a lightweight Kubernetes locally. I use Kubernetes a lot and often need multiple clusters or new clusters when working on different projects. Now, Kind is a great product which stands for Kubernetes in Docker. That's right. It's a Kubernetes cluster running as a single Docker container, which means it's extremely lightweight and disposable, and you can run many of them on your local machine. It starts up in a few seconds, and once you're done, you can simply delete the container. Now, starting out with Kubernetes, you'll want to go ahead and install Kubernetes tools. And the two important ones are kubectl. This is the command line interface to talk to Kubernetes, which is the one you're probably going to use the most frequently. And there are also dashboards that you can use like Lens to access Kubernetes clusters. 
And then the other one is kind. So you can go ahead and download the kubectl program and add it to your path so that you'll be able to access kubectl commands by typing kubectl. Once you type that command, you should see all the help text being displayed. Once you have kubectl, you'll want to go ahead and grab kind. You can do so by heading over to the kind website. You can go to the GitHub repo for kind, go to the releases page, and you can go to the various release that you want and download the binary right from here and add it to your path. Once you've added it to your path, you can run the kind command and you should see the help text. Now, the cool thing about kind is you can run multiple different versions of Kubernetes clusters side by side. So let's go ahead and create our first Kubernetes cluster. In this example, I'm going to use Kubernetes 1.23. I'm going to say kind create cluster and I'm going to pass in the image name I want to run, which is going to be the image for kind for Kubernetes 1.23.5. I go ahead and copy this to the terminal and this will go ahead and create a cluster. It'll download that Docker image and start up a single Kubernetes cluster in a Docker container. And now you can see our cluster has been provisioned and kind will automatically edit your cube config file. So you can immediately access your cluster by saying kubectl get nodes. And you can see we have a single node Kubernetes cluster up and running. We can also see the container by saying docker ps so we can see our kubernetes cluster running as a docker container now namespaces is a way to conceptually compartmentalize your Kubernetes cluster. You can have namespaces per teams, departments, business units, or product categories. It's a way to group certain systems together. And Kubernetes allows you to control permissions at a namespace level or a cluster level. In this demo, I'm just gonna set up an example namespace and I'm gonna call it CMS. So it's gonna be designed to group all my content management system resources in a single namespace. I'm going to create a namespace by saying kubectl create namespace and I'm going to call it CMS. Copy paste this to the terminal and I can see all namespaces by saying kubectl get ns which is short for namespaces. I do that and we can see our namespace has been created. And now we can go ahead and add all our resources to this namespace. Now, config map is a way to define a set of configurations, either as configuration files or environment variables. So config maps is an API object which allows us to store non-confidential data in key value pairs. So the key can be some key representing our config and the value can be either a file or it can just be a value that we can mount as an environment variable. Now it's generally recommended to have a config map per application. So not share them among many applications. And what I'm gonna do is because I don't need various config files, I'm just gonna create one config map which I'm going to use for my SQL to set a configuration value so I can show you how that works so to create a config map using the command line I can say kubectl and I want to run this command in the namespace CMS so I'm going to pass in minus n CMS and I'm going to create a config map and then the name of the config map is going to be called my SQL and then I want to create it by passing in a key value pair so you say from literal and the key is going to be the the key of the config. So I'm going to say it's MySQL random root password and the value is one. So this is telling MySQL that I want to generate a random root password. So I go ahead and paste this to the terminal. This will create my config map and I can list all the config maps in the CMS namespace by saying kubectl minus n CMS get config maps. This will list out the config maps. I can, this will list out the config maps. I can also say get CM, which is the short and for config maps. I can also output the config map by saying kubectl in the CMS namespace, get cm, the name of the config, and pass the output as YAML. You can see under the data section of our config map, we have the key and the value. Now secrets are very similar to config maps. The difference is that Kubernetes can encrypt secrets at rest. And it's always good to keep configs and secrets separated because we can set up different permission sets using RBAC, giving certain people access to configs and only a certain number of people access to secrets. In this example, I'm going to be creating two secrets. One secret is going to be for our MySQL instance, which tells MySQL what the default username and password is for the default user and the default database. And 
another secret is going to be the connection string details for WordPress, telling WordPress where to connect to in order to connect to MySQL. I've also placed a link in my documentation to Kubernetes secrets, which describes how secrets are used and using secret as files from a pod. So creating a secret is very simple. I'm going to create two secrets and notice that I create both of them in our CMS namespace. I say kubectl create secret generic, and I'm going to call this one WordPress and I pass in a bunch of key value pairs. These are the environment variables we're going to want to run in our container. For WordPress, I'm going to give it the details of where our MySQL database location is and the username and password. And I'm going to create another secret, which is going to tell MySQL the default username and password and database information. So I go ahead and paste that to the terminal that'll create our WordPress secret. And the following one here will create our MySQL secret. I can go ahead and list all the secrets by saying get secret. And we can see we have a secret for our MySQL instance and our WordPress instance. So now that we've gone ahead and built up our containers and we're ready to run them, the building block to do so is using a Kubernetes deployment. Deployments are constructs that help us define how we want Kubernetes to run our containers as pods. Think of a pod as a sandbox where processes can run, almost like our VM that we used to have. So we're going to want to run one pod for our WordPress instance and one pod for our MySQL instance. We can also scale up our applications by telling a deployment we want to run multiple replicas which will increase the number of pods now generally we want to run one container in a pod deployments will track things like health probes so when the pod becomes unstable instead of us manually having to go in and restart wordpress kubernetes will automatically launch and restart the pod so the cool thing about kubernetes is rather than writing a bunch of scripts to install wordpress onto a vm we can now declare declaratively describe how we want WordPress deployed by using a YAML file. So in my tutorials basics folder, I have a YAML folder and in here I have all the YAML that I'm going to show today. So I've got deployment.yaml and this defines a Kubernetes deployment. So we tell Kubernetes how we want WordPress deployed, how many instances we want. So I say replicas to the name of my application is going to be called WordPress deployment. And under a deployment, I define the containers I want to run. So here I'm going to have one container called WordPress. So in the container spec, I tell it the name of the container, the image that I want to run, the port that I want to expose. And then I can do things like pass in environment variables and I can map these environment variables to secrets or config maps. So you can see here I have used the secret called WordPress. This is the secret we created earlier and I'm mounting this to few environment variables. You can see I have four of them, the DB host, the DB user, the DB password, and the DB name. This will tell our WordPress instance where to find the database. And you can also see here that we're exposing container port 80. So even though we're exposing a port, how do we send traffic to our WordPress instance? And when we run our MySQL instance, how do we send traffic to that instance? This is where Kubernetes services come in. A Kubernetes service is a construct that helps us define how we want traffic to flow to our pods. A service can provide us with a public endpoint or a private endpoint. In this demo, we're going to be exposing our WordPress instance via a proxy, so we don't have a direct public endpoint. And we also don't want our MySQL instance exposed to the public. So we're going to be using two services, both being private endpoints. So to get our WordPress application deployed, I'm going to say kubectl in the CMS namespace, and I'm going to apply in the YAML folder, the deploy.yaml. So I say kubectl apply minus F and the location of the YAML file. If I go ahead and run that, that will go ahead and tell Kubernetes how to deploy our WordPress instance. And Kubernetes will go ahead and pull that container image and create two pods. And once the deployment is applied, I can view the pods by saying 
kubectl in the CMS namespace get pods. And if I run that, we can see we have two pods up and running. Now, as I mentioned for Kubernetes services, it's an abstract way to expose application running on a set of pods. Feel free to read more on the documentation. To define a service for our WordPress instance, I've created a YAML file called service.yaml. And in here, I've created a service called WordPress. And basically here, you define a list of ports and target ports. And the target ports are going to be on whatever the selector matches. So here we have a service called WordPress. We're exposing a port 80 on the service. The name of the port is called WordPress and the target port is gonna be 80. So it's gonna be matching the port on the pod of our deployment. The type of the service is cluster IP, which means private. And the selector is gonna be the label on the pod. So our pod in our deployment is labeled as app WordPress. If we take a look at our deployment.yaml, we can see that it has a label on it called app WordPress. So this is how services map to pods. And defining a service is as simple as that. To apply the service, I say kubectl in the CMS namespace apply, and I go ahead and apply that service.yaml file. That'll go ahead and create the service. And to list the service, I can just say kubectl get service. And SVC is the shorthand for service. Go ahead and run that. We can see we have a cluster IP service. And what this will do is give us an internal IP we can access our WordPress instance on, as well as the port that's exposed. You can see that there is no external facing IP. And inside the cluster, we'll get a DNS address called WordPress. This makes it really easy for us to access pods over the network in our Kubernetes cluster. Now we know our WordPress is going to need a database and we're going to be running MySQL as a database and we need to run it somewhere on some VM. Now running databases on Kubernetes is challenging because Kubernetes only meets you halfway. Similarly to a deployment, it allows us to describe how we want our pod to be scheduled using what's called a stateful set. Kubernetes will know that that pod needs data, so it will try to keep that pod on the same node it was provisioned. Then we're going to need to understand how storage works. So we'll need to describe our storage and then attach our storage to the cluster. And then we can schedule that pod onto that storage. Now how this will work highly depends on the storage that you use. Depending on the storage, if the node dies and the pod has to be moved, the storage could be reattached to another node and the pod could run there but this is not always the case this depends on the type of storage that you have available like an FTP network type share it also depends if the cloud provider can allow you to remove and reattach the disk and this doesn't always happen automatically if you're not attaching storage to your VM and just simply mounting the VM volume as a docker volume into the pod and that VM dies you may lose data unless you can guarantee that that virtual machine will always be available. Now, Kubernetes expects you to know all of this. So in this example, I'm going to show you how all of these constructs work so that you can make a better informed decision. Now, Kubernetes has this thing called storage classes, which is a way to describe what type of storage your cluster offers. Depending on where you deploy your Kubernetes cluster and which cloud provider, the provider may have storage classes that they support. So if we scroll down, you'll see that in Azure, you have Azure File Share and Disk. You have AWS Elastic Block Store. You have a bunch of different types of storage volumes. And here's one that you might know, which is NFS, or you can just use simple node local storage. Each of these different types of storage providers has its ups and downs. For example, node local will be the volume on the node. If the node dies or gets recreated, your pod will lose its data. If you use something like Azure File Share, that's a network type of share, which if the node dies, the share becomes disconnected and will reconnect to a different node where the pod is rescheduled. So it's important to understand the different classes of storage and what their limitations are and any latency that might be involved. In this example, I'm simply gonna use a local storage to show you how this all works. 
Now in Kubernetes, we generally use stateful sets to deploy things like databases or processes that require state. Stateful sets are pretty much just like deployments. The only difference is Kubernetes treats those pods slightly differently. Think of things like a web app. When web apps run as pods, we don't really care where it runs as long as it's up and running. Databases are slightly different. We don't want database pods moving around. So generally when a stateful set launches a pod, we would like that pod to to remain on the same node where it was provisioned because that's where its data is. Also for pods during a deployment, we generally load balance pods like a web server. We don't care about accessing each pod individually. With stateful sets, we may want to access each pod individually because a stateful set, we may run things like a cluster, multiple MySQL instances that need to talk to each other to form a highly available cluster. For more information on how stateful sets work, check out my stateful set guide. Now, if you take a look at our YAML folder, you'll see a stateful set.yaml. And you'll notice that the stateful set YAML looks a lot like a deployment. It has a name as well as a spec where we define things like how many replicas we want to run. And it also has a spec for containers. So we can also specify how many containers we want to run. In our stateful set, we also have a list of containers, how many containers we want to run in this pod. And here we only have one container called my SQL. And you can see it looks exactly like the container spec of a deployment. It has a name for the container, call it MySQL. It has an image we want to run, ports we want to expose. And you can see here I'm exposing container port 3306. This is the default port for MySQL. And you can see again, I'm mapping a bunch of environment variables to secrets. So you can see I have the MySQL database name. I've got the user. I've got the password for that user and the config map that we create earlier and the difference here in the stateful set I'm also creating a volume mount called DB and I'm mounting the same location as we created in our docker file when we ran the container on our local machine we're going to be mounting to var lib mysql that's the location where mysql will store its data so this is the mount point inside the container now for the mount point on the host we have a thing called a persistent volume now persistent volumes are pretty much like volumes that we defined in Docker. The difference is in Kubernetes, persistent volumes can be provisioned by an administrator manually using a YAML file or dynamically via a stateful set. In our stateful set, we pretty much provision a persistent volume using a volume claim template. So we give our volume claim a name. We're going to call it DB. And here we provide a spec. So we say what storage class we want to use. And in my cluster, there is already a storage class called called standard. If I do kubectl get storage class, we can see it comes with node local type storage. So I'm going to use that storage class to provision a volume. So here I tell Kubernetes the size of the storage I am requesting, which is 500 megabytes. So to show you how this all provisions, what I'm going to do is deploy the stateful set. I'm going to say kubectl in the CMS namespace, apply, and I'm going to apply the stateful set YAML file. I go ahead and run that. Notice that it also also created a service. So if we go and look at my stateful set.yaml file at the top, I defined another local cluster IP type service called MySQL. And this one looks exactly the same as our WordPress service. The only difference is it's exposing a port, which is different. And it's also selecting the app MySQL pod. So this service will select all the MySQL pods on port 3306. If I do kubectl get pods, we can now see that we have a MySQL pod up and running. And one key difference between stateful sets and deployment type pods is you can see the name of the pods in the WordPress one are more dynamic, where the name of the stateful set pod is fixed. So this will give us a DNS name for each pod that will be individually addressable. This helps for things like Redis if we want to run a Redis cluster or highly available storage. And if we do kubectl get PV, which stands for persistent volume, we can see that the stateful set volume claim template automatically provisioned a volume for us with a 500 meg capacity. And inside the CMS namespace, it's also set up a PVC, which is a claim for that storage. So this tells Kubernetes that we want to claim the storage from that persistent volume. So you can see here we've created a claim. This will mount the 500 meg capacity that we have in our persistent volume directly to our MySQL zero pod. Now a question I get quite
quite often is how do we access these pods that we've deployed since they only have private endpoints. The answer for that is using a thing called port forward that allows us to forward ports from our local host into the pod directly. The kubectl allows us to set up a proxy to do this. This means we can go ahead and test these applications without needing public access. Port forwarding to pods can be done in a number of ways. I can do kubectl get pods to get the name of the pods that I want to port forward to. And then I can do kubectl port forward followed by the pod name I want to port forward to and the port I want to connect to. This will port forward my local to the pod. Notice when I go to localhost port 80, I'm now hitting the setup page for that pod. I can also port forward to a service if I don't want to go directly to one single pod. I can do this by saying kubectl get service, get the name of the service I want to port forward to. And then I can say kubectl port forward service slash followed by the name of the service and the port. I can do that. That will port forward to the pods behind that service. Refresh this and see we can still hit the WordPress instance. So now that we have our systems up and running, I get a lot of questions about how do we access our microservices or applications in Kubernetes. Now I'd like to answer that with a question back to you about how do you manage it in traditional infrastructure, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud as virtual machines, you generally run some sort of proxy or load balancer in front of all your web applications. And then you would, based on the host name and URL, route the traffic to your backend services. Proxies like Nginx HAProxy is widely used in these situations. Now the same thing goes for Kubernetes. This is where ingress controllers come in. Ingress controllers allow us to define this thing called an ingress, which declaratively states how we want traffic to be accepted at the edge of our cluster and routed to which pod. So we can accept traffic from a central place and then route it to back in Kubernetes private services based on the URL of that service. So to see what an ingress looks like, if we take a look at the YAML folder, we have an ingress.yaml. And in here is what an ingress looks like. So we give it a name, the type is ingress, and we specify rules. So here you can say all traffic coming to my cluster on this path needs to route to this backend Kubernetes service. You can also route by domain name. So you can say one domain and a certain path go to service A, and another domain and another path go to service B or you can route traffic from a single domain to multiple services just by using the path. So you can do something like say v1 go to service WordPress v1 and v2 go to service WordPress v2. Do something like that. In my example, I'm going to take all the traffic that comes into this ingress controller and say everything on slash go to WordPress. So I point it to my WordPress service on port 80, which is the port exposed by the service. So this allows us to route traffic to multiple Kubernetes backend services. And the beauty about Ingress is all that developers need to know is understand the YAML. We don't need to learn how to configure Nginx or how to configure HAProxy or whatever the Ingress controller is behind the scene. The Ingress controller will take this YAML, automatically transform it into Nginx configuration and hot reload it within the proxy. Now to deploy the Ingress YAML, we're going to need an Ingress controller. Now there's quite a few different different types of Kubernetes ingress controllers available. I'm specifically going to look at the popular one called Nginx, which you can find on GitHub. This is the ingress Nginx controller. Now remember, when you deploy controllers to Kubernetes, you want to make sure you look at the supported versions table to deploy the right ingress controller for the version of Kubernetes that you run. Now generally for these system level type components like ingress controllers, your monitoring solutions and so forth, you want to use things like Helm charts or you want to grab the YAML and store it in a Git repo and use something like customize to deploy it. It's important to keep these things in your Git repo as a source of truth. So if we take a look at the installation guide here, we can either use Helm or use kubectl apply to apply the YAML manifests. In my GitHub repo, I already have this put together for Kubernetes 1.23, and I'm going to deploy the ingress controller by saying kubectl apply minus F, and I pull through from the GitHub URL controller version 1.1.3, and I grab the static cloud deploy file. I'm going to go ahead and paste 
paste that to the terminal and that will go ahead and deploy a bunch of resources it creates a namespace called ingress nginx a service accounts RBAC rules cluster roll and roll bindings and the actual deployment of the ingress controller now if i do kubectl in the ingress nginx namespace get pods i can list out all the pods and you can see my nginx ingress controller is up and running so this pod will take all the traffic coming into my cluster if i do get service on this specific namespace you can see that i have an ingress controller type load balancer service so ingress controllers will run a load balancer service which is used to get a public ip now if you're running in the cloud you'll get an external ip available here if you're running an aws you'll get a dns name which you can use as a cname record if you're running an azure or other cloud providers you'll get an ip which is static which you can then bind to your domain name and then send traffic to this ip address now because we're running in kind kind doesn't have load balancer support so what i'm going to do to test this out is i'm just going to port forward by saying kubectl in the ingress namespace i'm going to bind to address 0.0.0.0 and i'm going to port forward to the service we're looking at on port 80 and now if i go to my url notice that we are hitting the nginx backend this is because there's no ingress yaml deployed yet so our ingress controller is running now we have to define ingress rules which will configure nginx so to do that i'm going to apply my ingress yaml in my cms namespace i'm going to say kubectl apply in the cms namespace and i'm going to apply the ingress.yaml file go ahead and apply that now the ingress controller will automatically load this configuration if i port forward again and we go back to our page refresh it you'll see we now hit the wordpress site so our ingress is working successfully so hopefully this video will help you take a look at your existing infrastructure and put a picture together in your mind of what you need from a kubernetes perspective to move your traditional infrastructure into containers and then move them onto kubernetes and give you a high level indication of what building blocks you need and then hopefully you can take whatever you've learned in this video and apply it to your infrastructure and it'll help you deep dive further into topics that you need information on now if you like the video be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell and let me know down in the comments what sort of videos you'd like to see in the future and if you want to support the channel even further be sure to check the patreon link down below or click the youtube join button to become a member and as always thanks for watching and until next time peace